It's officially crossover week here at the Locked On NFL channel. We're going to have a crossover episode with Matt Derry, host of the Locked On Lions podcast, to preview some of the storylines for both the Detroit Lions and the Denver Broncos, plus Justin Simmons, the Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee for the Denver Broncos for the third consecutive season. We talk about his impact both on and off the field and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked On Broncos. You are Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back in to a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Locked On NFL Network, your team every day. Great, as always, to have you here, Broncos country, for your first listen of the day. Thank you so much for making Locked On Broncos the first thing you listen to every single day. When you wake up, you're on your way to work, you're working out at the gym, or you're on your way home from work. We appreciate you. You can get Locked On Broncos also on YouTube, so make sure you hit that subscribe button. Also, on your favorite podcast providers, we're there for you as well. I'm Cody Rourke, host of Locked On Broncos joined alongside by Sarah Bettinger, co-host of the show. Both of us cover the Broncos for the Lockdown Network and Nine News. But ladies and gentlemen, today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, our crossover special is brought to you by our good friends over there at Stat Hero. And Stat Hero is the first of its kind daily fantasy sports platform where it's you versus the house in head-to-head fantasy matchups, win or take all. You can sign up for free right now at stathero.com slash lockdown and use promo code lockdown for a 100% deposit match bonus today. Sarah, my friend, that's a lot, obviously, on the open. Great to see you as always. Can't wait to preview the matchup with Matt Derry of Locked On Lines a little bit later. But first, we got to get some Broncos news and notes, my friend. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, it's always good to see you, Cody. Always good to get to talk Broncos football. Get back on the saddle this week. Get the team another victory. Hopefully, we'll talk to Matt a little bit about the Lions and how the Broncos might be able to get that done. How a good old friend might be doing over there, Trinity Benson. But uh, it's good stuff, man. It's great. It's great to talk to you. It's great to interact with Broncos country. Great, great stuff this whole week, man. I feel like it's been a good week. It has, and we're back in the saddle again, my friend, as you had mentioned there. Some Broncos news and notes as the team returned back to the... uh, (laughs) Some news and notes as the Broncos returned back to the team facility on Wednesday for practice, but there were two players that were missing from practice that are evident. Obviously, Bradley Chubb, as Vic Fangio had mentioned in his Wednesday media scrum, Bradley Chubb dealt with a little bit of a shoulder injury against the Kansas City Chiefs. It impacted him a little bit, and his ankle, they're continuing to monitor that, but he should be good to go this Sunday against the Detroit Lions. And I think that Broncos country's initial reaction after hearing Bradley Chubb would miss practice on Wednesday was, wow, he's injured once again. What's going on? It's just the nature of the game. And when you haven't played an entire season, you, you're going to you're gonna experience that. You're going to have, like, for example, for a, a guy who's a pass rusher that has to punch and use his arms and extend up, when you haven't done that in quite some time, you go out there and at full force and you do it, that's where you lead to some strains. It's nothing serious. He's going to be fine against the Detroit Lions for the most part. So, obviously, that's going to be huge. Uh, Shelby Harris, you know, he, to- he impacted his ankle, twisted it a couple of weeks ago on Thursday, didn't play against the Chargers. He did return against the Chiefs. They're just monitoring that. Obviously, some general soreness there for Shelby Harris. He should be good to go this Sunday against the Detroit Lions as well. But I think the real big topic I want to talk with you and Broncos country about with Sarah today is Justin Simmons, the Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee for the organization for the third consecutive season. And the Walter Payton Man of the Year nomination, it's going out through all 32 NFL teams, and it highlights players who have impact both on the field and off the field in a significant way. And Sarah, I I don't think that there's anybody else in this organization. There's a lot of great players that do a lot to give back to the community. I don't think that there's anybody as more deserving as Justin Simmons to be recognized for a third consecutive season for the Broncos organization. Uh, you're absolutely right on that, Cody. And look, a lot of people didn't really like that whole discussion that took place a few weeks back about could Justin Simmons be the face of this Denver Broncos franchise? Because let's face it, I mean, safeties in NFL history have been the face of a franchise. But let's get into this because I think it, this is something that can't be overstated. Justin Simmons embodies every single thing that you could ever possibly want in a role model in the NFL for your, if you have kids, this is the guy's jersey that you want your kids to be wearing. This is the guy's jersey that you should want to be wearing to the game. I mean, he's making such an impact in the Denver community. He loves the Denver Broncos. He signed a deal with the team after some of the darkest years in franchise history. And of course, it's great for those guys to go out there and get paid. But look, Justin Simmons could have easily said no. He could 
could have easily gone and, and shopped his services around this coming off season after playing another year on the franchise tag. Instead, he wants to be part of rebuilding the culture in Denver. And, and a lot of times, Cody, uh, fans on the internet, they love putting words in Pat Boland's mouth more than any other thing yeah. that I've ever seen. Pat Boland would never this. Pat Boland would this. I think we can safely say that the late, great Hall of Famer Pat Boland would absolutely love Justin Simmons. He would be one of his favorite players. He is everything that that the the Bolin administration in Denver used to value in players highly. Yeah. Highly value these guys. I think Justin Simmons is everything that you could probably want. He gets the job done on the field, of course, but off the field, man, it's the it's the impact that he made off the field that I think is going to leave a legacy in Denver. And of course, we hope that that is coupled with eventually maybe a, a Super Bowl win or two or or three. Let's get a little greedy on that one. But uh, <laughs> I would love to see Justin Simmons be able to have a Super Bowl trophy and a Walter Payton Man of the Year award by the end, by the time it's all said and done for him. No, spot on. And I, and I want to share a, a story here. Some of you have heard this story here, but what Justin Simmons did for me and my family without like, there was nothing that would have indicated that, you know, Hey, I would have gotten reached out to or anything, but you know, my family, we had experienced a little bit of a tragedy. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, a, a day after two days after I get a text message and it's from Justin Simmons. And I'm like, how did he get my number? Like, that's another thing. How did he get my number? But he had reached out to me and he had said, you know, hey, you know, my family, we are all praying for you and your family during this. Like, that's just the type of person that Justin Simmons is. Justin Simmons and I had no prior communication prior to that. But ever since that had happened, I've always been a big advocate for Justin Simmons. And, you know, he's a good DB. As you mentioned, he's a good football player. But the great human being part of what Justin Simmons offers to the organization, I think, Sarah, to the world in general, that's one thing I love the most about what Justin does is that he cares about every Everybody. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a janitor or if you're some somebody who's not as big in the media as other people, you know, like myself. That that's exactly who Justin Simmons is. I think it speaks volumes about his character. The Broncos have a good one. Now, I do want to bring something up here. I was watching on Instagram Live. He went on with Will Blackman, former NFL player, and obviously a Boston College person there. And they were having wine. They were doing a wine and talking session there. And he was asked a question. Justin was about this season, and he said, "You know, Vaughn was a big voice, and you know, obviously when you lose a guy who's been around, who's been a Hall of Fame guy, he said, I came in my rookie season. I had Darius Stewart, T.J. Ward, Chris Harris Jr., Keith Talib, Bradley Roby." as guys that I watched and observed and how they did things, how they treated young guys. And he says, I've always taken that, the experience is there, and I've applied it to me now. And he says, I'm still learning. He says, but even after the Vaughn trade, I have to step up more. And I've realized that. And we've got other guys with voices that are stepping up. Sarah, I think the Broncos are heading in the right direction. And I think if there's any player that any other young player watching or that is on the organization, on the team, or even just an employee of the team, they're going to look at Justin Simmons and be like, you know what, I need to follow what that guy's doing. I think the Broncos, they're in good hands for the future. And ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate you for tuning in today's episode. Locked on Broncos coming up here in just a moment, though. Sarah and myself, we're going to talk with Matt Derry. We're going to bring him on to talk about the Denver Broncos versus the Detroit Lions coming up here in just a moment. We're going to break down that matchup. But first, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's episode. Locked on Broncos are good friends over there at Stat Hero. And no one plays daily fantasy sports to lose. Plain and simple. Winning feels so much better, but traditional fantasy sports are a long-term losing proposition because you never know who or what you are up against. And here's the crazy part. Stat Hero, they show you their lineups before you play, and you handpick the team that you want to face one-on-one. -on -one. This never-before-seen innovation of a fantasy sports and sports betting hybrid has Stat Hero players clocking odds that are over four times better. And you can check it out today. Sign up for free right now at StatHero.com slash LockedOn and use promo code LockedOn for a 100% deposit match. That's StatHero.com slash locked on. Use promo code locked on for a 100% match. StatHero.com slash locked on. Promo code locked on. Terms and conditions apply. It is once again a special locked on crossover edition here on the NFL channel. It's locked on Broncos crossing it over with the locked on Lions. And to talk with Sarah Bedger, myself, of locked on Broncos, it's Matt Derry, host of the locked on Lions podcast. Obviously, a matchup against the Denver Broncos and the Detroit Lions at Empower Field a mile high this Sunday afternoon. It's going to be a fun one, I think, for both teams. A lot of storylines that accompany this matchup. But, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you and your audience here. And can't wait to uh, learn a little bit more about the Lions from you guys uh, always uh, great to talk to you as well a, a rarity Lions and Broncos don't play that much um, but sort of weird timing for this game and all of a sudden Detroit has a little momentum and I'm sure the sky is falling in Denver after a Sunday <laughs> night right 
<laughs> it is at six and six. I mean, fans are still freaking out. You know, there's still a chance that the team can make the playoffs. Fan, I mean, it's just, it's doom and gloom a lot of the times. There's some fans out there that are you know just as optimistic. We take things week to week. I mean, that's that's the thing I've told fans like, hey, you want to preserve your sanity, be a week to week person. Like, go go through and see how things are going with the teams. But obviously, the Detroit Lions coming off of their first win of the season, Matt, obviously big for them. They've been trying, they've been fighting and clawing to get to that point. What has the vibe been? Because we were just talking about fan base. But amongst the Detroit Lions fan base, what has the vibe been from them so far this season? Because as we talked about before we went on air, they've been really competitive. They've been in games. They've lost late in games. But there's still a lot, I think, that they can build on going into the next season. Yeah, I, I think, Cody, the biggest issue with the Lions was, are they going to go 0-17? Is this going to be a total disaster? Then they tie the Steelers, and it's like, all right, well, they won't go 0-17, but they're going to go 0-16-1. and Because this team has a recency of a winless season, Going back to 2008, there was that chance. And to be quite honest, no matter how hard they play, no matter how many how, clo- how many close games they played, uh, they found themselves on the on the wrong end every time. So this past Sunday, to be one play away, fourth down, four seconds on the clock, and then inexplicably Mike Zimmer and the Vikings just allow Amon Ross St. Brown to just run a basic slant pattern and stand in the end zone and catch the ball with no defenders around him. It was like, wait a minute, did that just happen? So there's a sigh of relief that this is not going to be a winless team. Now you've got the, there's two factions. You've got the let's win again, this is fun. And you've got the, whoa, whoa, stop winning. Because if we if Jacksonville and Houston catch us, we're not going to get Aiden Hutchinson, who everybody around here loves, from Michigan. So um, it's a weird vibe, but certainly uh, there is an exhaling uh, in Allen Park with the Lions practice that, hey, we got one, we got one. I was going to ask you too, is there, is there like, you know, there's like the suck for luck campaign back in the day and there's <laughs> been other ones. What's the Aiden Hutchinson saying and phrase in, in, in Lions fandom right now? Well, no, it was, uh, it was tank for Tibbs for a little while. Or, uh, came on Thibodeau. Uh, but now that Hutchinson has just had a monster year and now he's going to New York to be a part of the Heisman trophy uh, ceremony. Um, and he's local. Of course, his dad, Chris, played at Michigan, war number 97. He played at Michigan. Michigan is like the team here. Uh, Despite Michigan State being very good, you've got a lot of media in Detroit that are uh, total maize and blue slappies. So that helps fuel the fire here. But no, he would be a fit for sure in Detroit. And I think that either he or or Thibodeau would go one if the Lions had that choice. Now, they're going to possibly need a quarterback, although the Lions notoriously never draft quarterbacks. Um, But uh, yeah, there there is that sentiment here that, Aiden Hutchinson would be a great fit. And to be honest, attendance is down. The Lions are having a hard time selling tickets. You draft that kid, that would pick up uh, the energy around here a little bit. You know, one of the questions I was going to ask you too, it's more of a matchup-based question, right? We were talking about Swift, and, and I think that Sarah and I are both in agreement. He's a fantastic back when you watch him play. Unfortunately, they've been missing in the last couple of weeks. Obviously, the shoulder injury he sustained on Thanksgiving was a big blow to them. But the, the one question is to uh, uh, the wide receivers. You mentioned Amon Ross St. Brown. Also, Josh Reynolds has been a nice addition, at least from my perspective as an outsider, watching him. And obviously, he and Jared Goff will have that connection. What What is the key for the... Lions offense this week against the Broncos, specifically with the guys in the secondary that they have with Ronald Darby, Kareem Jackson, Justin Simmons, and Patrick Sertan the second. Well, look, I I think Patrick Sertan is awesome. Uh, He's, I would, I would guess that the ball will not come his way much this week. It's not the line that this is not the air Coriel chargers from the eighties or, or, or the run and shoot or anything like that. I mean, the lions are going to run the ball a lot. Even with Jared Goff feeling a little bit better right now, looking better. Heck, is the NFC Offensive Player of the Week? Like, what? But he is. I don't necessarily think that come Sunday the Lions are going to come out with four wide and spray it all around against that secondary. This is still going to be the Jamal Williams show. DeAndre Swift, I don't think will be ready. Uh, Jamar Jefferson and Godwin Iguobuike. They've got a nice stable of running backs that they use. And it's still a run-first offense under a new play caller, Dan Campbell, who stripped Anthony Lynn of his play calling duties a few weeks ago. And now they're running a lot. Not that they weren't running under Lynn before, but um, this past week was, I think, an anomaly that Goff was having to throw the football more because they were losing at the end. They had to come down the field. But uh, no, you mentioned Reynolds and St. Brown. I mean, they're fine. That's a really weak point of this team. They need an edge rusher high. They need a quarterback high in the draft. They're going to need to get a receiver at some point. 
very high, whether it's late first with the Rams pick or in the second round, because that group really isn't very good. Uh, but St. Brown had a good game, like you said, and, and Josh Reynolds is coming on, but those are third and fourth receivers. They need better than that. And uh, against that Bronco secondary, it's not going to be easy this week. Well, the Broncos and Lions, you know, I, I don't know if necessarily almost is the right word, but I mean, we know George Payton inquired about the price of Matthew Stafford, what would have been a blockbuster trade. The two teams did come together on a little trade after the preseason that had a lot of Broncos fans ticked off. Uh, Trinity Benson going to the Detroit Lions. So uh, I'm interested to hear how that experiment has been going with the Detroit Lions. I mean, I kind of know some of the answer just based on looking from afar, but Give us the give Broncos fans the update on how Trinity Benson has fit in with Detroit through the first uh, 13 weeks this year. Sarah, you want the update? Here you go. You ready for the update on Trinity Benson? <laughs> I mean, he, is he on the team? I don't even know if he's on the team. I think he's on the team. You want to talk about George Payton, okay? And I know everybody calls him George Patton because they don't know his real pronunciation. But that's a win. Check the box. I mean, he got a higher round draft pick. I know they swapped some picks around, but – to get a fifth round pick for a guy, I, there are games I don't even know he's playing. You got to go to PFF and go, oh, wait a minute. He played 18 snaps. He played 20 snaps. He's done absolutely nothing. So for I know Bronco fans are like, what are we doing trading Trinity Benson? I don't think he's caught a pass in weeks. I, I got to be honest. I, yeah, I, I, would, I would score that a victory for the Broncos. I, this is a kid that maybe they like down the road, but he doesn't play a ton. And when he's out there, you don't even know he's out there, to be honest. Yeah, he was the he was the flash at training camp in the preseason. He had a very fantastic yeah. showing. And a lot of people, even us, we were we were talking about before the 53 man roster projection went final. We thought he was going to be on the 53, but a few days before that, bam, trade. We, everybody was kind of shocked because he was really a standout guy and Denver was trying to figure out between, you know, behind KJ Hamler, Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, who are you going to go with? Who's going to be that next option there? And everyone thought it was going to be Trinity Benson, but obviously uh, situations are different, and we'll see if it works out for him in the long run. If he, uh, you know, if he's on the team next year for the Detroit Lions, but obviously, uh, you know, a, a fantastic young man. But then again, like it, different situations, different environments, they all mean something in the NFL. And ladies and gentlemen, coming up here in just a moment, we're going to flip the script a little bit. Matt's going to ask us questions about the Denver Broncos, and hopefully, we can provide as much context that will help inform Lions fans as best possible as to what they may see from the team that the Lions are facing on Sunday. But before we do that, let me tell you about one of the sponsors. Today's episode, Lockdown Broncos are good friends over there on location in Super Bowl 56 is at SoFi Stadium in less than 100 days. And on location is the official hospitality partner of the NFL. It's the only place to score a once-in-a-lifetime Super Bowl ticket and experience package. You get to select your exact seats and you get to choose from elite experiences featuring an exclusive pregame celebration with NFL legends, five-star LA hotels, and food that is chefed up and cooked by the great Wolfgang Puck. Visit onlocationexp.com slash SB56 to be able to get those tickets and more information today or search Super Bowl on location. That's onlocationexp.com slash SB56 or search Super Bowl on location today with our good friends over there on location and our good friends over there, betaline.ag. And betaline has you covered all season long with more odds, props, and contest information than ever before as football season begins its march towards the playoffs. And betaline line remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50 percent welcome bonus when you use promo code locked on from basketball football nhl boxing and ufc bet line is the number one place not to mention even if you like your favorite las vegas casino games they have you covered there at bet line as well so don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers for the 2021 season bet line is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports bet line where the game starts Matt, all right, my friend. You know, obviously, great conversation. We have a, a matchup: the Broncos, the Lions, this Sunday in Power Field at Mile High. Broncos fans got to get a little bit information, got to know a little bit more about the Detroit Lions. But now I'm sure that uh, Detroit Lions fans are a little interested in this Broncos team as well. So, whatever questions you have, fire them our way. Yeah, fellas, let's let's talk about it here on this Thursday crossover: uh, Lions and Broncos. I, I think I said it in the open a little bit too. It's like. These two, I can't remember the last time these two teams played. I, th I remember the, uh, the Stephen Tullock game in Denver years ago when he did the Tim Tebow and got <laughs> down on a knee. Um, but it's been a while since uh, the, the, the Lions have seen the Broncos. What's going on in Denver? One week it sounds like, wow, playoffs, and this team goes on the road and wins a big game. And then obviously uh, on Sunday night, you know, you have all these receivers under contract, getting extensions. Javante Williams looks like a stud, but yet – 
you know, your quarter. But I mean, this could be the check down bowl, right? Golf versus uh, Teddy. I mean, this is the sure. Brad Johnson, Rich Gannon bowl, right? What's going on in uh, what's going on with this team? Sir, I'm gonna let you answer this one to start off, my friend. Ah, oh, that's a that's such a fun question. We get to just kind of give the brief synopsis of what the Broncos are. If you've ever been on a, a thrill ride at a you know an amusement park, that's kind of what the Broncos are. Only when you go down, it's not super exciting. When you go down, it's just super you know infuriating for everybody. The Broncos have really low lows, and they seem to have pretty darn high highs. I mean, against the Dallas Cowboys. They were kind of dominant against the Los Angeles Chargers, too. And then you have games like this past weekend against the Chiefs where, like you said, Matt, I mean, you watch – that's a lot of people's first exposure to the Broncos this year because they stunk so bad the last few years. They don't get a lot of, you know, national games. So that was not a good showing against the Kansas City Chiefs. A couple weeks before that against the Philadelphia Eagles, you had the infamous Teddy Bridgewater lack of effort on a fumble recovery and all these different <laughs> types of things. I mean, I mean – it, it's just you you don't know what you're going to get with this team. Like you mentioned, Teddy, I mean, he was checked down. Cody and I have talked about this on a couple shows. He checked down on a free play uh, this past weekend, and he checked basically checked down on a two-point conversion, threw it, threw it in front of the, the sticks, so to speak, threw it in front of the goal line on a two-point conversion. And it's just been tough. It's been a tough, tough deal. I mean, on the one hand, it's like Teddy's the best QB since – Peyton Manning, you know, retired. And on the other hand, it's like, well, what good is that really doing anybody at this point? But here we are in December with meaningful football games. So I suppose if nothing else, that's not, you know, Broncos fans probably couldn't ask for a whole lot more based on the, the fact that team won just five games a season ago. Cody, are they a playoff team, honestly, in your mind or no? Well, it goes in back to what Sir said. wide open. Yeah, I mean, so I think for the Broncos right now, the thing that impacts them the most, especially as they get in these final five games, I think they have to win at least four out of five to really make it, to have a chance at that seventh spot. And the reason is their conference record right now is not very good. They were three and four going into the Chargers game. They made it four and four. Now they're four and five in AFC conference play. You know, tiebreakers, they lost that to the Browns. They lost that to the Steelers. And obviously those teams are in there as well. Uh, so really for Denver, they have a matchup, obviously, this week against the Lions, next week against the Bengals the week after that on the road at the Raiders and then a road game against the Chargers and then they close out the season with a home game against the Chiefs that's a tough five game stretch now I, I think you have to win four out of five in order to really have a chance but right now I'd say they're probably not a playoff team even though there's a chance there's a lot they have to overcome and I think the biggest question which team are you going to get and Sarah and I had actually talked about on yesterday's episode of Lockdown Broncos we were talking about this Detroit Lions team and the fact that I felt like there would be more pressure specifically on the Broncos. If this was the game, like if the Lions didn't win last week, there's always that pressure. I think for the opponent that the team is playing to say, Hey, what if they get their first win against you? I also think as well, there's still a lot of pressure because now the Lions they've got that victory. And now, you know, there's some players that maybe want to feel that experience again. And, and what better way to do it by ending the hopes and dreams of another team. So it, it's going to be very dependent on which Broncos team really shows up. But, it's going to be a long road for them to be able to get to the playoffs. They have to take care of business in these last five games. Matt Derry, Locked on, Lock, uh, Locked on Lions, Locked on Broncos. Cody and Sarah, these guys do a great job with that show, Thursday Crossover. Either one of you answer, but you know, if you're, if you're the Lions uh, defensively, and obviously they've, they've done a nice job as of late and have played better on that side of the ball, but what, what, what should scare them about this uh, week? We talked about Bridgewater, but – it looks like the receivers and Noah Fant and, and Williams, it looks like an offense that, that could take off, but just hasn't. Why is that? That's That's been largely on the shoulders of Teddy Bridgewater. And I think that the one thing like you mentioned, what could scare the Lions defense, I think maybe the Broncos running game really hitting its stride in recent weeks. You know, I, I've seen the Lions, you know, in three of their last four games, given up 16 or less points, which I think is is really key for them. For the Denver Broncos over the last three, four weeks, it's really been finding that identity on offense because Teddy Bridgewater isn't it. If you put the ball in his hands to have him win a game, especially as we've seen this season from behind, he just can't do those types of things. He's He doesn't push the ball downfield. He's missing a lot of easy reads this year, which for a quarterback that I think everybody in Broncos country was, was led to believe, hey, this guy's the safer option. This is the veteran option this is the guy that's going to help you you know stabilize 
as the offense, he's made a few really, really bad mistakes, I would say, that don't necessarily result in interceptions. But, man, when you're talking about sacks that he takes that are just, you know, unnecessary throws that he could have made but decided not to for whatever reason, I feel like that's really the, the area where the Lions could take advantage, putting that pressure on. Teddy forcing him to make quick because he likes to sit back there in the pocket and hold on to the ball. And, and even then he still doesn't push the ball downfield, which is insane. But I, this is the plight that we face this year. It's just so frustrating. But the, if anything, it's the running game where the Broncos, I think, uh, you know, will plan on having success with a healthy, stable Javante Williams, Melvin Gordon being back this week, potentially from a hip injury. And then Mike Boone, who played his first game this past weekend and won angry runs on, on good morning football. So We'll see what happens in that regard, but I think that's their primary strength at this point. And they traded Von Miller, obviously, early in the year, but yet they still get to the quarterback, Cody, right? Uh, is that still the strength? You mentioned the secondary before, and, and Sertan, some people are saying defensive rookie of the year with Micah Parsons. What about the rest of the defense? Yeah, I mean, you you talk in new guys at inside linebacker and Baron Brown and Kenny Young. Kenny Young was an off season, like a mid season trade before the deadline by George Payton to help the Broncos at inside linebacker. There was one to, one point where the Broncos had four of their inside linebackers on injured reserve, and I believe two of them were season ending. So they needed some help there, and Baron Brown and came back healthy, and then they got went out and they got Kenny Young from L.A. And from that point forward, those guys have been instrumental in the Broncos' success on defense. But Denver's been sending a lot of four man pressure. To too. They haven't really gotten as unique in terms of sending five or six guys. They tried that against Jalen Hurts, and then he hurt them with his legs, and he also hurt them in the passing game when they tried to do that. So Denver has gone back to the traditional Vic Fangio four-man rush, play coverage with the secondary, and also athletic linebackers, and that's been working out for them. The Broncos' defense played well against the Chiefs, but unfortunately the offense, they couldn't keep up. Predictions, guys? I mean, do you see a, you see Denver coming home and, and, get, and making this a get-right game or a get-well game? Uh, I I don't know if the Lions can win two in a row, and that's it's never an easy place to win and to travel cross country with the with, with the thin air and everything else. But uh, what do you guys think? You know, my philosophy, Matt, is always from the start of the season. It's it's seventeen and zero until we ain't, and right now it's eleven and six until <laughs> we ain't. And, and and so my my prediction, or not my necessary, I'm not predicting seventeen and zero every year, of course. But but at the same time, you know. I like to approach the, that kind of thing, a prediction from the standpoint of if I was a player on the team or if I was a coach on the team, I'm expecting to win every week and doing everything that I can to win. I think the Broncos, obviously, this was a game that I think everybody kind of penciled in as a win before the season. And, and it certainly, you know, has me sleeping better at night, knowing that the Lions have already won a game. Like Cody said, I, I would not want to face this team not having won a game already. I think there's just like a slight, as we've seen a lot of times in, in, you know, Broncos recent history, you win a big game and then you have a, a big letdown the next week. And not that I'm necessarily expecting the Lions to come out flat or be poorly coached or anything like that, but you just, you get that vibe that they've been really working towards getting that win as they've galvanized around getting Dan Campbell, his first win as a, as head coach of the team. And, and, yep. and I get the vibe that I think the Broncos are going to come out this week a little bit more focused and a little bit with a chip on their shoulder after that loss to KC. Cody, what do you think? Give me give me 20 seconds. Uh, you know, I, I think Sarah summarized it pretty quick, you know, pretty well there. And I want to I want to be up front here, especially with Lions fans. As somebody who's been an outsider, I you know, watching a lot of red zone, I see the Lions on red zone more than I've seen the Broncos in the red zone. So that's actually some positive <laughs> news there. So I will t I will take that. And obviously, you know, I I've I've been a big fan of Dan Campbell and and look for this Lions football team, a lot of young players, a lot of young talent. I think we're gonna see a chippy, scrappy game. And look, I would not be surprised if it's close to be honest with you Matt I just think that this is the nature of the NFL it's been so wild this season we just haven't really been sure that the teams that are circled are favored to win they come into the week and everyone's like all right this team's gonna win and then the team that nobody expects to win wins so that's how weird the NFL season has been I think it's gonna be a chippy and I think it's gonna be a fun game I think for both sides so we'll see how it ends at the end of the day I think it'll be low scoring as well I think with these two quarterbacks um Keep in mind as well, uh, yes, they love Dan Campbell and they're playing for him. They're sick. Like, literally, there's a flu bug going through this locker room oh, no. right now. So the Lions, it's not COVID-related. From uh, the, the center, Evan Brown, is in the protocol. We'll see his status. He's actually played pretty well for the injured Frank Rag now. But uh, we'll see if this flu bug and then having to go into the thin air affects them. But it kind of the up-down theory, Broncos seem to be up-down every week. So 
they're due to win and the Lions are due to going back to losing. So we'll have to wait and see. Now we'll have to see how things go. But as always, Matt, we always appreciate your insight. I know that Broncos fans learned a lot about the Detroit Lions. And I'm hoping that the Lions fans learned a little bit something about the Denver Broncos from us Absolutely. as well. That's why I love doing these crossover episodes. And just a reminder, we want to thank you for making Locked On Lions, Locked On Broncos, your first listens of the day every single day for your podcast information, everything up to date on the Detroit Lions, the Denver Broncos. Matt, Sarah, myself, we all appreciate you for tuning in here on the Locked On NFL Network. The Denver Broncos hosted Detroit Lions this Sunday in Power Field at Mile High. Afternoon kickoff. We'll have you covered on Lockdown Broncos if you're a Broncos fan, and Matt's going to have you covered on Lockdown Lions with the post game report from that action. Thank you so much.